anecdote I wanted to tell you is about 20 years ago, almost over 20 years ago, Germany got reunified. And it took like a long time, I think like 15 years, to basically unify the signaling system and the regulations about it um, in order to have unified train traffic within Germany. And I mean, this is, those were two train systems that had the same foundation, which was really old. So because of safety, this is by no means um, trivial. So and here's the vision. So left, that's the past, that's Europe. And thanks to two technologies, ERTMS and ETCS, um, it should be possible to go, to, to get into train in Cologne and go through Belgium and end up in Amsterdam or in Paris or wherever you want to be. So this is really, really cool. And for this purpose, um, this technology has been created, the European Railway Traffic Management System. And part of this, the European Train Control System. And don't be overwhelmed. I'm giving you like a very quick walkthrough of what that entails. And then I'm going to talk about the business case, why this is actually a real problem. Okay, so let's have a look at the train and the train tracks. This is how it's supposed to look with the new system. So if your tracks here, you have a train and it has a controller on board, which is this ETCS system. And the tracks have like these passive um, emitters on the tracks and the, the car sends out a signal and gets an ID back so it knows where it is. In addition, it uses GPS and radio signals to figure out where it is. This didn't work like that in the past. In the past, trains and engines were not very intelligent. So this new system actually puts a lot of intelligence into the engines. So just keep that in mind. Let's have a little look at the engine itself. Again, don't be overwhelmed. So you have like this EVC, the ETCS vehicle controller in the middle, which has a number of sensors, like for example, the radar to see how, how fast it's moving, these antennas to read out the balises, these little passive emitters, and so forth. So this controller is like very important and it is definitely safety critical. Because another thing is very important, if you go on a high-speed train, do you really think you can properly see the signals on the track side at full speed? Not really. So um, with the ETCS system, train signals, like the physical signals that you see, like a traffic light, are optional. So they're not required anymore. So it's really, really important that the train knows where it is and what it's doing. So this is a very important piece of equipment. And in a second, you'll see why this project was created in the first place. OK, so Open ETCS is a project for building these controllers in a different way. So I already mentioned, there are a number of problems here. So what are the challenges of implementing such a system? So number one, the actual specification is not precise, and it's not precise for a number of reasons. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but they authored it in Word. It has like 500 pages. They're different versions, tricky. Cost is high, so I already mentioned, this train controller is much, much more intelligent than controllers were in the past. The operators were basically saying, why should we do that? What's in for us? Will we sell higher priced tickets? Well, I mean, rail providers are already squeezed between airplanes and buses, so they're, they weren't really sure whether the investment um, would come back. Complexity. So also with respect to safety, this is a huge issue. Version changes. So uh, after they created the spec, they realized that some changes are necessary and that has to be taken into consideration. And last, authorization procedures. Every single engine that is being built has to be um, authorized and um, with a lot of regulation and it's very expensive to do that. So let's look at two of these problems with a little bit more detail. Number one, ambiguity, I already mentioned it. The specification for this has been written by a consortium. And I don't even know when that was, like 15 years ago, something like that. And they looked for the smallest common denominator, and that was Microsoft Word, which, well, 
it's questionable whether that's the right tool for the job. And what I find interesting is you have like a lot of these intentionally deleted sections. I mean, it's, it's really hard. They, they sometimes use the word cross-reference mechanism, sometimes not. Sometimes it's simply hack in the section headings of the chapter they want to reference. Um, sometimes they use like inconsistent numbering schemes. I mean, it's, it's just not the right tool for the job. So that's one problem. Second problem, high cost. I already mentioned that there, um, the, the controller is much more expensive than um, traditional controllers. And here is a study from 2009, and I'm only going to show you half the slide. This uh, was commissioned by Deutsche Bahn to figure out, can we afford these controllers? And so they have a scenario for this time frame, 16 years, they need like almost 4,000 engines. And so they looked at the cost. And depending on how you commission them, they came to 233,000 euros per controller, or in a better scenario, still almost 170,000 euros, compared to today's value of 60,000. So this is bad. And you all know that train operators are already squeezed financially. So there was a problem. So what to do, what do, do about that? And so especially those two problems are addressed by the Open ETCS project. So here's the idea. The concept, they called it open proofs. So this is related to open source. It goes like a little bit further. It says, we want to have tools that are open, but they should operate on artifacts that are open. So you want to publish what you're working on as well. And last, if at all possible, you also use open standards. So don't just, you know, think up any standard, even if it's XML, that's not an open standard, but something that is really um, properly standardized by a body. That's the idea behind open proofs. And so the idea was, let's take this approach and create a formal model. What's interesting is when the project started, um, they didn't, the, the, the consortium writing the proposal, didn't decide on a formalism. They also didn't decide on a tool platform yet. So that was basically decided during the project. So the idea was to build a model of this 500 page document essentially, and to um, create an API. So the idea was to simply model the software part of this controller. So the idea was that all the manufacturers of equipment, so um, there would be like companies like Siemens or Thales or um, um, I don't know, you know, you know, Bombardier, for example, like that they all have their own hardware, but that they create um, an abstraction layer between the API and their own hardware, and then reuse the same model. And so initially the, the idea was that the model should be in a way, done in a way that for those who want to, could even do code generation from it. So the idea was really to create this open model of the specification have all the vendors use it, and then basically distinguish themselves in the marketplace through the hardware that they um, drive with this open model. So that was the idea, and I mean, the, the hope was also that new, um, new vendors would enter the market because having this, these resources available would really make that attractive. Okay, so that was the idea, and then again, they, they commissioned this analysis, which basically said, well, um, if you create this API, in the best case, you have unit costs of 97,000 euros, or maybe 103,000 euros, but the idea, but, but you can see that the hope was to drop the unit costs significantly. And that's an acceptable price for Deutsche Bahn to do this. All right, so, um, the proposal was written and the project was actually approved as an ITA project and this is what we did. So the project started mid-2012, was initially planned for three years, got extended by half a year so it will end on December 31st and it was basically split into three phases. Phase number one, figure out which technologies to use in the first place. Number two, do the actual tool development or configuration and year three, the, the bulk 
of the modeling. And of course, as you can see that the modeling is very important, the idea was that these three blocks overlap. But this gives you like a rough idea on how this was actually planned. And again, because openness was like a really important um, aspect of this, um, all the artifacts are online. In fact, we use um, GitHub as a platform. Okay, so, but you're here because you're interested in Eclipse, so I want to tell you about the OpenETCS tool, which is Eclipse-based. So as I said, in the first year we did uh, some technology decisions. So the first question was which technology platform to choose, and Eclipse was without question the winner. Eclipse has definitely the right ecosystem and components for something like this. Um, the development took place um, roughly along the, the V model. Who here knows the V model? Can I see your show of hands? Yeah, so that's why I figured most of the people, those who are not, it's like a, yeah, an approach where you gather the requirements, you go over the design phases and so forth until you end up with the implementation. And on the right hand of the V is the V and V validation verification um, with appropriate traceability between it. And I'm going to show a picture of that later on. And so, so you basically start with the requirements. And in the Eclipse ecosystem, there's the requirements modeling framework, which is in fact based on an open standard, an OMG standard for requirements exchange, which is used at the underlying data model. And so this was the obvious um, um, tool for this, also with the right maturity. Then for system modeling, um, SysML, using Papyrus as a component, had been chosen. Um, there were other contenders, especially B or Event B, for those who know it. It's a fairly formal language, but also with good support in the Eclipse ecosystem. It uh, was considered a little bit too formal, and also some aspects like the breaking curves uh, were kind of tricky to model in that formalism. So we also looked at existing tools, specifically at the time top case, which now is Polasys and OOSE. Um, and there was quite a concern about the maturity of those tools, and that's why at the time, that was 2012, um, they were turned down. Also, there's a partner in Belgium, and they developed a tool called Yetim as formal specs. It's um, actually not Eclipse-based, so there was one concern to be able to integrate that into the, into the ecosystem. Also, um, there were quite a few discussions about what is a formal model anyways, and the academics, wouldn't consider UML really formal, it's kind of semi-formal, that kind of thing, while um, like people from industry say, oh yeah, that's, that's plenty of formality for us. So, so there was a discussion there. YTML formal specs, they created a tool, and in the context of this project, they actually put it open source. So if you're interested in another approach, check it out. Um, problem here is the consortium as a whole didn't consider their approach formal enough, they considered it more to be kind of a domain-specific language to translate the word-based specification one-to-one -one into, yeah, something um, formal that follows a DSL, but not formal enough to do proper reasoning about it. That can be argued, but so that was turned on as well. So we ended up with um, an Eclipse-based ecosystem, and there were a lot of activities. The following, oh yeah, Sorry, I forgot one point, commercial backup. So another concern was to have some alternative to migrate to if the open tools don't scale or, or don't hold up for what had to be done here. And there are Skate Systems and Skate Suite were chosen, Skate Systems in particular, because it has um, an interface um, to um, Papyrus. So that was the argument there. So. Um, this is the Eclipse-based ecosystem, and you can find on the, the GitHub website uh, the details, but this shows you roughly in which categories the various components fall. So we have like the word-based subset 26, and then the requirements components. We have the main block here, the system modeling. There are supporting functions like traceability, VNV, configuration management. EN5128 is the um, standard for safety critical um, software, software and systems development. And yeah, so this just gives you an idea that we were active like in a number of areas. And I'm not, I don't have the time to talk about all of them. 
Okay, so this is something that we are really, really sorry. Again, this is 2012, and their modelers built some prototypes of Papyrus and basically said, look, it's nice, doesn't scale, it's not usable enough, we don't want to use that. So we are really, really unhappy about that. We had like great support from CEA, and in fact, we did a migration from Kepler to Lunar because the Lunar version of Papyrus um, was significantly better than the Kepler version. But the bottom line is that, that we lost the modelers. So that left like an ugly gap in their tool chain, even though we have quite an ecosystem based on um, Eclipse. So I talked about the V model initially. So this is basically the, the V model we came up with with the various components. Again, you find that online. So we have like a lot of supporting functionality, which is all in the open source. Those are the blue blocks. We have the requirements management going all the way to system modeling. But at this point, the modelers switched to, um, um, to SCADE. Um, there were some more prototypical approaches with system C on the bottom. And again, on the right-hand side, you see that SCADE fills out this whole block. Nevertheless, um, there is a continuous tool chain and um, we have like a lot of components which we hope to take to another level at some point. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the requirements engineering. So because that is where we really think that the result is quite successful. So as I said before, we had requirements based in Word and that was like really, really ugly. So the idea was to take these and transform them into the RECA-F format, which is an open format for requirements exchange. And so here you see the Word document, and I'm not sure whether you can see that in the resolution, but there were like all the section headings, there were images in there, and so forth. Um, but, but you can't really do traceability, you can't annotate things, and so forth. So we developed a converter that converts this to RECA-F, and which is domain specific. So it contains, contains a number of heuristics and extracts information directly from the word and translates it into corresponding structures that you have in RECA-F, like traces between elements and annotations and so forth. So here's a screenshot of the tool. And I don't know whether we have the time, but I want to also very briefly show the tool itself. So where you have like um, a typical Eclipse application with the Project Explorer and the, the outline. Um, and you see that the appearance is maintained. So the RMF framework supports formatted text. It forma supports all the embedded images and so forth. So, and it allows to enrich them. And one thing which was also very important is this converter from Word to RecIF creates um, unique human readable IDs. So this was really important. So it takes like the way the specification is written with all its section headings and then takes it and the position of the indenting and the bullets and whatnot to generate a unique ID out of that. And if in the future a new version of the standard comes out and new requirements have been inserted, maintaining the conventions from the Word document, then you, you should be able to have a mapping of the old version to the new one to see exactly what has changed. But in the context of a proper requirements tool. So now I want to show you just very briefly how this looks in, in the tool. Um, and, and this will be kind of tough because I have two different uh, views here. So let's see. So in theory, this should, oh, it's starting on my screen here, so let's Oh, there it is. OK, so I guess you can, can see that here. So, um, so it looks fairly standard. We have here basically our model folder. And like all these artifacts are available in um, GitHub. Yeah, you see this is like suboptimal the way I'm doing it here. So I want to go to chapter three, which is kind of the biggest chapter. Oops of tricky here. So, um, give me a second. So here it is. 
So what you see is um, one of these models has multiple documents in it, and this is the, um, the main one which represents the, the word document. Um, okay, I don't know what that is all about. So, but here you can see you have, oh, this is kind of smaller shell. So this is, um, looks fairly similar to the, yeah, I want to have the link column as well, fairly similar to the Word document. If I go here a little bit further down, you see that there are embedded images. Um, yeah, and on the right-hand side, you also have traceability. Um, I can't see anything here. Oh, here you go. So this is linked to this element, and here in the property view, you can see the target element. What I won't show you here is we also created um, a prototypical traceability <coughs> plugin that allows the traceability directly from the requirements um, to the Papyrus model, and which would show you right here in the requirements view a textual representation of the corresponding UML or SysML element. And, well, not sure whether it's worthwhile on this resolution to um, have a look at the model. The, um, actual model is the high-level system model, which was done with um, Papyrus. Let's see. Um, but again, I mean, I, I don't really have the ability to show much here with limited resolution because Papyrus really needs a lot here. So it's mainly block diagrams and internal block diagrams that um, were created here. So just let me open one to give you an idea. I'll keep it short. How much time do you have left? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, good. So here we go. Yeah, it's, it's kind of smallish. Yeah, I think you get the idea. So basically what happened is we did the requirements analysis right in Eclipse using the RECAF model. Then we did some system modeling on a high level, and at that point, they switched over to SCADE. So with that, I want to go back to um, the presentation, except that this is the wrong slide. Um, Okay, so basically I'm already um, approaching the conclusion of this. So <clears throat> when the project ends in less than two months, what do we have? So this is what we have. We have an Eclipse-based uh, domain-specific tool, although there's really net, not that much domain-specific additional stuff in here. So to give you an example, besides what you've already seen, one big question was like the data dictionary, um, which is um, domain specific. And there was like another tool that converted that directly into a um, UML profile. Um, definitely one of the, the big achievements is having the subset 26 in the RECAF format. And we really hope and, and are talking to representatives of the rail industry to see whether they're interested of migrating to something more professional away from Word. So for example, RECAF is supported by all big tools, including all versions of DOORS by now, so the traditional DOORS as well as the DOORS next generation, PTC integrity, and many, many tools support RECAF. So if, if there's really interest, it would be possible to, to take this already converted um, um, requirement specification and migrate it to a professional tool or even use Eclipse um, as the common tool and work directly on this model. So this would be like already a great achievement. So then of course there's the actual um, SCADE model which was initially based on the SysML model that was created in Papyrus. And this doesn't cover all aspects but it covers enough to have a functioning rail system. So, and one of the things that we're going to produce um, um, at, at the end of the project is a demonstrator that uses an existing tr line, in this case like the Utrecht Amsterdam line, and basically takes the model, um, 
animates it through code generation or direct animation. I'm actually not sure what the demonstrator people are up to these days. And they want to put it on a simulator so that you can actually write on this line on a simulator driven by the model generated in this product. So there's a real life demonstration that this actually works. And last, there's also like this um, ERTML formal spec. Again, they put it into the open source. It's kind of an alternative approach, which at this point is disconnected from this. But so one result of this project is that there are like two distinct open models of the same um, um, specification. So, and of course, we hope that the rail industry is using this and Deutsche Bahn in particular really hopes that prices of controllers will fall significantly due to this project. So what's happening next? Well, we definitely want to make sure that, that this doesn't stop and everybody goes home and says that was nice. So the specific plans for exploitation. So one of the big required results of this project is that all the partners need clear exploitation plans. So everybody is going to um, um, report on that by the time the project ends. Number two, we created a foundation, a nonprofit, that will be there, uh, will, will oversee the resulting artifacts from this project and also keep things together and also look into um, follow-up research projects. So there's quite a bit of activity right now. Currently, the most promising is that under the Shift to Rail initiative, um, there will be a follow-up project that will take the artifacts from this project to the next level. Um, so right now, we don't have anything specific yet, but I'm sure that this will not just end, but that there will be a lot of ongoing activities. And with that, I would like to conclude, I hope, you found this interesting, and um, if you have questions, go ahead. Questions? Yes. Um, the Papyrus and um, Skate model, uh, can they be, is it the same? Or uh, can it be converted, or what's the problem there? Yeah, that's a good question. So for those who didn't hear, the question was, what's exactly the problem with the Skate and Papyrus models? So um, the, the problem is that Skate Systems is not Skate Suite. So Skate Systems is a commercial systems engineering tool that uses Papyrus under the hood. So there was initially the hope to be able to work on the same model with both tools. Turns out that SRL, the manufacturer of Skate Systems, heavily modified um, the model. So for example, they constrained the use of model elements, and also um, Papyrus couldn't really um, show all information um, in a usable manner from the skate model. That was problem number one. Problem number two is that in order to use um, the skate model, the skate systems model, you needed some um, libraries from SysTRL, uh, sorry, from SDRL, the, the manufacturer of skate, and for a long time, it was unclear what the legal situation on the usage of those libraries was. That was the second problem. The third problem was that SRL lagged behind um, the Eclipse release train. So um, especially CA was like really helpful in making everything work. And they um, were like a little bit frustrated because they said, look, a lot of the problems the modelers have with Papyrus are already resolved in the Luna version of, um, of Papyrus. However, um, SDRL didn't release um, a Luna Papyrus um, skate systems version um, at the time that Luna was released. So we were like in the situation, should we move to Luna, but lose at least temporarily um, interoperability with skate systems, or should we wait? And that was like a little bit frustrating because you can convert um, Kepler Papyrus artifacts to Luna, but not back. So those were the main problems with that. Um, and, and last, um, Skate Systems is for system modeling. But the idea in this project was to go one level down. That wasn't possible with Skate Systems, but with, with Skate Suite. 
And Skate Suite, despite the name, doesn't have interoperability with Skate systems. So basically what we did is we did the system modeling with Papyrus as far as it was possible and then did a one-time migration to Skate Suite and then basically um, the, the, the two models were disconnected. Other questions? Well, I'll be around today and tomorrow, so if you have more questions, please approach me. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>